Let me ask you a question. We intuitively understand that when it comes to consciousness, humans are different than dogs and that both are different than rocks. We also know that in the case of humans, consciousness has something to do with our brains and we can probably say the same about dogs. Now, the question is, if humans, dogs and rocks are made from the same stuff, namely matter, then what exactly is it that makes them so different in relation to consciousness? This video is the first of a series in which we'll learn about the Integrated Information Theory, or IIT for short. It is usually associated with the work of the neuroscientists Giulio Tononi and Christoph Koch, although there are many others contributing to the theory. IIT uses math, science and philosophy to help explain consciousness. In this series, we will focus on some of the mathematical aspects of the theory, as well as its philosophical underpinnings. To begin answering the question I posed earlier, we need to first notice that at a high level we can think of virtually anything as being a system. A system is just a set of things that work together. For example, we can understand the brain as a system made of neurons. In IIT, the parts of a system, that is, the subsystems, are called mechanisms. But there are multiple ways of dividing a system. So, for the brain, the mechanisms could be the neurons, for example but it could also be different groups of neurons. But what is the relationship between system and mechanisms on the one hand and consciousness on the other? The philosophical view of IIT is that consciousness has some essential properties. So for any system to be considered conscious, it should have characteristics that mirror and allow for those properties. We'll discuss a fair amount of details further in this series. But the general idea is that, in order to evaluate the potential for consciousness of a system, IIT uses the concept of integrated information, which makes sense given it's in the name of the theory. The information aspect is about how much a part of the system makes a difference for the system as a whole. And the integration aspect has to do with how much the collaboration between parts generates information that the parts alone cannot. The amount of integrated information in a system is represented by the Greek letter phi. Technically, in IIT there's a difference between lowercase phi and uppercase phi, but we'll use just one for now. Now, phi is a measurement that can be applied to any system. But among all overlapping systems and subsystems, for IIT it is only the ones with locally maximal phi that can be called conscious. But we'll come back to how that works later in the series. For now, to understand the underlying math of phi, we need first to explore some preliminary ideas. As I said, phi is applicable to any system, and that includes the brain. But the brain is a difficult thing to understand. So to make things easier, we will consider instead systems that are made of a different type of mechanism, logical gates. A logical gate is just a mechanism that applies a logical operation on its inputs and provides the result as the output. Logical gates have binary values, 0 or 1, as both inputs and output. Here, we'll use basically three types of logical gates, AND, OR, and SHOR. I'll give a quick overview of each, in case you're not familiar with them. Let's use three inputs and see what the output would be for each combination of values. Let's start with the logical gate AND. The output is 1 if the first input is 1 and the second input is 1, and the third input is 1. In other words, if all of its inputs are 1, then the output is also 1. Otherwise, the output is 0. For the logical gate R, the output is 1 if the first input is 1, or the second input is 1, or the third input is 1. So if at least one of its inputs is 1, then the output is 1. Otherwise, the output is 0. Finally, the logical gate SHOR which means exclusive OR. With SHOR, if exactly one of its inputs is 1, then the output is 1, otherwise the output is 0. As I said, we are considering logical gates as the mechanisms of our system. Now let's imagine how such a system would look like. I will draw arrows to show if a logical gate has its output used as input for other logical gates. I will also highlight the mechanisms that, at a given moment, have one as their output. We could have as many or as few logical gates as we want, 
but 3 is a good number, so we'll just skip one of each type. In IoT, it is important to consider how mechanisms interact over time. So instead of showing the system at a single moment as I am doing now, we will look at it across time, with t0 being the current slice of time, t-1 the past, and t-1 the future. The connections among mechanisms will be shown between one slice of time and the next one. In order to calculate the amount of integrated information in the system, we need to first evaluate the information generated by each single mechanism. This is done by looking at how much a given mechanism constrains the past and future states. Let's start with the past. Suppose we don't know anything about the current or past states, but we want to know the probability of a past state. This p means unconstrained probability, while this other p is to indicate that it's a past state. Since we have no additional information, we simply assume the distribution is uniform. Three binary outputs give us eight states, each with probability 1 over 8. In IIT, this distribution is called the unconstrained past. Ok, good. But what if we suppose that current A is 1? How much does the state of A constrain the past state of the system? Or another way of looking at it, how much information can A give us about the past state of the system? Strictly speaking, these two questions are not the same, but the technical distinction would be too much for us to discuss right now. And although the first one is a more precise way of stating the issue, the second question might be more helpful in understanding what is going on. So for the rest of this video, I will treat them as more or less equivalent. Now by looking at the connections, we know that current A is affected by past B and C. So in this case, what would be the probability of a certain past state given that current A is 1? We can calculate this by applying Bayes' rule. The probability of a particular past state given that current A equals 1 is the probability that current A is 1 given the past state times the probability of the past state divided by the probability of current A being 1. For the probability of the past state, the value will be 1 over 8 in all cases, because we are assuming uniform distribution. Similarly, the probability of current A being 1 is 6 over 8, since out of the 8 possible states of the system, 6 of them have A equals 1. Finally, for the conditional probability, we use the fact that A is the logical gate R. So the probability of current A being 1, given the past state, will be 0 if both past B and past C are 0, and it will be 1 otherwise. From this, we can plot the distribution of probabilities for past states, conditional on current A being 1. This is called the cause repertoire of A. Now we can compare that to the unconstrained distribution of the past state that we found earlier. We can calculate the distance between the two distributions using a measure called the Earth Mover's Distance. I will not go into the details of that measure, but the intuitive idea is to imagine that the distributions are piles of dirt, and the distance is the effort required to turn one pile of dirt into the other. In IIT, the distance between the unconstrained past and the cause repertoire of A is called the cause information of A. The distance between the distributions in this particular case, that is, the cause information of A will be 0.33. This number is simply a measurement of the amount of information that A carries about the past state of the system, that is, the cause of the current state. But that is just half of the story. Now we need to check how much information the mechanism A carries about the future state of the system. At a first glance, it might seem that we could use the same calculations we did for the past state. However, past and future states are not symmetric. In the first case, we were looking at the causes of the current state. Now we are going to look at its effects. Besides, when calculating the unconstrained past, the current state played no role. But we know that the current state will determine the future state, and we can use that information even if we don't know what the current state is. 
But before we can calculate the probability of future states, there are two important things to know. The first is that IIT has the assumption that there can't be instantaneous interactions between the mechanisms. Mathematically, this means that when calculating the conditional probability for the whole system at a time t, we can use the probability for each mechanism separately. The second important thing to know is that in IIT we need to avoid undesired correlations due to common inputs to mechanisms. For example, the output of current C is an input to both future A and B. So, even if we focus on how current A affects the future state of the whole system, the common input from C can create correlations that are not about current A. To deal with this issue, IIT uses the idea of virtual mechanisms, which is basically to pretend that each input comes from a different mechanism. With that in mind, the way we calculate the unconstrained probability of a future state is by summing over all possible current states considering them as virtual mechanisms, the probability of the future state given a current state times the probability of that current state. Or, in other words, for each current state of a virtual mechanism, we look at how likely that state is to happen and, in case it did, what it means for the future state. But this is just a stepping stone. The virtual mechanisms and the assumption of independent conditional probabilities allow us to turn this whole sum into a sum for each mechanism. Remember that we are still talking about the unconstrained probability of a future state, but we are calculating that by evaluating the future state of each mechanism separately. And because of that separation, we no longer need to use the virtual mechanisms. Let's go through an example. Suppose that we want to know the unconstrained probability of the future state 1, 1, 0. That is, where A is 1, B is 1, and C is 0. The probability of any current state is 1 over 8. Mechanism A is the logical gate R. So the probability of future state A being 1 is 0 if current B and C are 0, and 1 otherwise. On the next sum, we also have 1 over 8 here. Mechanism B is the logical gate AND, so the probability of future B being 1 is 1 if current A and C are 1, and 0 otherwise. For the last sum, we also keep the 1 over 8. Mechanism C is the logical gate SHORE, so the probability of future C being 0 is 1 if current A and B are equal and zero otherwise. With all that in mind, we can finally calculate the distribution for the unconstrained future, which in this case will look like this. Okay, we're done with the unconstrained future. So now, let's assume that current A has 1 as output. We can ask the same question about the information that A carries, but in this case, for the future state. To get there, we need to know what is the probability for future states given that current A is 1. Using the idea of virtual mechanisms and the assumption that the conditional probabilities are independent, we can break the probability of the future state into the probabilities of its components. Let's focus on the first component. Here we have current A fixed as 1. But notice that even though we are working on the effects of current A, we still need to use the connections for the other mechanisms since they can influence the probability of a future state. Specifically, to determine the future state of A, we need to also consider what can happen with current B and C, like this. Let's understand what's going on. We sum over all possible states of current B and C, and use that together with A equals 1, as the condition for the future state of A. Then we multiply that by the probability that current B and C would be in the given state. And we do the same thing for the other components. To use the same example as before, suppose that the future state we are evaluating is 1, 1, 0. Focusing on the first part, there are four possible states with mechanisms B and C. So this probability is 1 over 4. 
Now, conditioned on current A being 1 and a given state of current B C, the probability of future A being 1 will be 0 if B and C are 0 and 1 otherwise. Similarly for future B, we have 1 over 4 here, and for the rest it will be 1 if current C is 1 and 0 otherwise. Here we only need to look at current C because we know that current A is fixed as 1. Finally, for future C, we have 1 over 4 here, and here we have 1 if current B is 1 and 0 otherwise. All that is left to do is calculate the probability for each future state and we'll have the effect repertoire of A. Now, by using that and the unconstrained future, once again we can calculate the distance using the earth movers measure, and the result is the effect information of A. The distance between the two distributions in this case, that is, the effect information of A, will be 0.25. Once again, this number is just an indication of how much information A carries about the future state of the system. Now let's review what we've done. Without knowing anything about the states, we calculated the unconstrained past and the unconstrained future. Then, by fixing current A as 1, we found the cause repertoire of A and the effect repertoire of A. With those, we calculated the cause information of A and the effect information of A. What remains is to put all of that together. We can now define the cause effect information of A as being the minimum between the cause information of A and the effect information of A. In this case, it would be 0.25. This represents the minimum amount of information that A carries about either the past or the future of the system. Or, more precisely, how the information in A constrains the past and future states of the system. Now the same thing can be done for mechanisms B and C, which will tell us how much information those mechanisms carry. But we won't do it now. The important thing to get from this video is the overall method of evaluating how much information a mechanism carries. According to IIT, it is the integration of information among mechanisms that will tell us the potential for consciousness of a system. Here we talked mostly about the first and almost nothing about the second, and both are important parts of the integrated information theory, as the name indicates. In addition, we still need to answer the question from the beginning of the video about how humans, dogs and rocks are different with relation to consciousness. Unfortunately, those topics will have to wait for another video of this series. Until then, thanks for watching.